Good afternoon, friends. Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. I'm here with Janet Morana, our Executive Director and Founder of Silent No More. That's right. Hi, Janet. We're coming to you from our Priests for Life headquarters here in Titusville, Florida, and this is a an emergency live broadcast, That's if you right. will. Well, uh, yeah, and first of all, I just want to apologize to our viewers. Normally at the 3 o'clock, we broadcast the Rosary, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, and then what would normally follow at 3.30 is a live show with me and some special guests. However, uh, because of some breaking news <laughs> out there with the LA Times about this documentary that's coming up, about Norma about McCorvey, Norma McCorvey the Jane claiming Roe the Jane Roe Wade. of Roe v. Wade uh, flipped back to being uh, pro-abortion, or they like to say pro-choice, uh, on her deathbed is so much of a lie, so false, so crazy, that we said, that's it. We had to get in the studio right now and tell you the truth. You know, that, you know, uh, we've, and, and we've the, known, the, first of all, Father Frank and I have known Norma for decades, decades. You know, <laughs> it, it, it is no surprise to us, right? It is right. no surprise that whether using clips of interviews done with her towards the end of her life right. um, or trying to retell her story or trying to get this or that person to say this or that, it is no surprise that the advocates of abortion, skillful liars that they are, would try to twist this, twist of course. this story. Because this is a painful story for them that actually very many in the pro-life side of this debate don't even know, don't even know that the, the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. ended up rejecting Roe v. Wade. Right. They, it, it, people still don't know that. When we, we've been telling this story because we've been part of this story. For years. And we've been Thanks. telling it for years. And, and, a lot, and still to this day, you know, you would think you would get to the point where people say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know that. We know that. Right. They don't. No. And now, so now in a sense that <clears> this, <throat> this effort of the other side to try to get people to think that it was all an act, that it was all a, a, a lie on her part, you know, uh, is actually going to get more people to realize that she did convert, which they didn't know. But let, let's... Well, why don't you just go back for a minute, Father, because as Norma would, had always told us and told everybody, uh, you know, she never had an abortion. And so that's to be a fact. That that's right. No, she did not clear, have an abortion. Clear, clear, clear. Yeah. She never had an abortion. In fact, she had three pregnancies and, and gave birth to three babies, all girls. Yeah. Uh, the first birth was uh, her daughter, Melissa, who her mother helped raise. Uh, the second baby, uh, I believe, if I recall this correctly, she plays for adoption. And then there's the Roe baby, the baby in question, which, by the way, she never met. They were all people, again, when you talk people claim things, throughout the decades, they claimed I'm the Roe baby. And Norma, remember Norma always told us, there's one thing about that baby only I know, she mm -hmm, said. Mm -hmm. And I'll never, I, she goes, Father, I'm fine. I won't even tell you <laughs> because that's the only way I'm going to know for certain when that, that child comes forward that yeah. it's really them. Well, so let, she let's... always had people. Uh, as a matter of fact, the funniest time when she had um, an Asian uh, woman said that she was the real baby. <laughs> Norma laughed about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? well, so. well, let's put this in context. First of all, let's, uh, people don't even know what we're talking about here. Uh, this afternoon, we, we've known for some, some, some days now that there's this documentary right. that is coming out on uh, Friday, Friday night. night. So right. we haven't seen this documentary. We haven't seen it. Um, that uh, some people made in the final, the final uh, years, years or, 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 or months or, or years. Months of, We're not of, sure of Norma's exactly. life. Right. That um, now, today, the LA Times and a number of other publications uh, have brought, put out these articles that say, oh, you know, and, and it's amazing how uncritically the advocates of, of baby killing just, just absorb this and then they proclaim it as dogma. You right. know, now you're going to see now it's proclaiming as dog. AOC even tweeted about this already. Already? Liar that she is. Oh, my uh, gosh. Uh, 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 saying, oh, yeah, hey, hey, guys, you know, hey, this Norma McCorvey, she wasn't really pro-life after all, you know. And the narrative that they're trying to create it's crazy. is that the right, with a capital R, I guess they, th they consider us part of that. I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. um, paid her 
and she put on a, a big act so she could get money from the right. I want to delve into some of these things so people know oh what was what was going on over those years. Um, but this is why we wanted to come on right away because now all of a sudden in the last couple of hours are just been exploding well, yeah, on, on email, social my media emails, and email. My emails people are calling phone, us and, and yeah. whatnot. Look, <laughs> well, let, 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 let's. Well, Facebook audience, if you have a question, <laughs> type it in here oh, and we'll yeah. answer it. No, no, it's. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <sighs> Let, 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 let me put this in, a, in, a, in okay. an initial context here. What if somebody, here's how we feel about this right now. Uh, just seeing these initial stories, we've seen some of these clips, you know, and, uh, 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 and we can give you all the context of, of, of how or why Norma would say various things. Um, but let me put this in the context of, of how this makes people like us who knew her intimately for decades didn't swoop in at the end of her life with cameras, you know, but, but knew her for decades through all the ups and downs and ins and outs of her journey right. with her in the public moments and with her in the private moments, hearing her public speeches, in fact, arranging many of her public and speeches. And sometimes substituting for and her. Substitu and hearing the private conversations that nobody will ever hear. Here's the perspective I want to give you right at the outset of this. What if somebody, what if you had a sibling who passed away a few years ago, right? And somebody comes along to you today and says, hey, by the way, uh, you know, your brother, your sister was lying all their lives about this, that, or the other thing. It's like you, you, you feel this sense of, you know, who in the heck do you think you are exactly. trying to tell us about this person that, that, yeah. that we knew inside. Oh, who do you think you are? Norma was not somebody that you get to know by being a journalist. No. Norma was not somebody you get to know by putting a microphone in front of her mouth or a camera in front of her face. She resented that, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. You know, remember when, when, <laughs> when, when just, to, just to touch on one moment of, of her, her complex journey, when um, we, when I received her into the Catholic Church, right. I received her into. The, she called me the catalyst that brought her into the Catholic yeah. Church, and I was sitting next to her when you confirmed her. And the, that was church. a ceremony. You right. Remember, mm -hmm. not a single reporter was allowed in. Right. By whose decision? Norma. Norma's. Norma's. This was August of 1998. Right. In there, in uh, and she in, said, in Texas. "This is not for the public to know." This, this is, is not. She said, "This is my life, and I, I'm going to be Catholic, and I'm not going to answer a bunch of questions about why I'm being Catholic." You and he, she said, "Father Frank, you and Father Robinson, who was her actual spiritual director right there in Dallas, mm -hmm, and of course you mm -hmm. did other spiritual direction with her." She said, "You guys know. I, I don't need them to know." No, and, and 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 and, and <clears throat> you know, we were we were we were fine with people, you know, reporting on it, and you know, if 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 uh, if if she wanted media to be there, you know, we were fine with with that because obviously it did become a story, especially in the Catholic world, right. that the Jane well, Roe of Roe v. Wade became after, Catholic. After it, she said, "Father, you want to send a press release?" Yeah, yeah she Go allowed ahead. us to send a press release. She said, "Send but, a press release." <laughs> but but I'll never forget the conversation. It was right be before the mass, and uh, uh, you know, she she said, "We are not letting if somebody comes in here with a camera." with a microphone, with a reporter's uh, pad. You know, right. I don't want them here. This is our, we're, we're worshiping the Lord here in this, right. you know, in this moment. Um, well, you know, Father, too, t tell, tell our Facebook, our audience here, you, the specific homily of what you said about the babies and Norma. That was very important because she carried that throughout her life. Remember what you said? She did, yes, yes. You know, uh, and we had talked about this many times. Right. Um, it was at this mass where, where, where you know, we received her into the church. I gave her the sacrament of confirmation, which usually only a bishop can give, but a priest can do it if he receives the person into the into the Catholic Church in that same ceremony. So I was privileged to put that oil of confirmation on her head. And um, and by the way, you know, again, these are things you don't fake. Uh, I want to talk about her her journey of healing with you. Uh, but the journey of spiritual preparation for the sacraments and entering into the church, like you mentioned, it was Father Robinson who was right. also passed away, and myself and, and, and some others who were involved. Uh, you, don't, you don't fool around with those things. No. 
this woman was received into the Catholic Church, and you know what you're talking about was uh, the actually the comments I made after she received her first communion, right. and I said, Norma, you know, in in the Catholic faith, we believe that the you know the body of Christ makes us one body, brings us all together, mm -hmm. and um, you know, in Christ, all humanity is united to God. And that includes the unborn, and that includes all the babies whose lives were lost because your name was on that decision. But in receiving the body of Christ, we are reunited with all humanity, including those babies. So I said to her at this moment, you know, you are, you are reconciled with those children. And she carried that with her all, all her life. She never forgot those, uh, those words. And I always remember her saying, though, that that burden still she knew the lord forgive, forgave her she knew all that just like women who've had abortions who've come through healing know that but then that forgiving of yourself for what you did is that ongoing journey which actually norma carried her whole life well you know people who who now are it's amazing to see aoc and you know these uh, uh these um mindless uh, uh pro-abortion fanatics out there just jumping on, they're taking this hook, line, and sinker, you know, that, oh, she made this up, because they think, the, they think that the whole movement that we're involved in is made up. They think the entire pro-life message is made up. This is, you know, to start putting this in, in context, you know, the people that are saying this, you know, and they're going to be saying over the coming days, oh, yeah, Norma just made this up, um, or this is just about making money. Oh, yeah, right. Uh they think the whole pro-life message is made up. They think that when we say the baby in the womb is a baby, that that's made up. They think right. that when we say babies are dismembered by late-term abortion, that that's made up. Right. They think that all of this is made up. They think that when we say we're ready to help women to, to um, choose life instead of abortion, that that's made up. Well, of course they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna sound the same. They're going to sing the same tune. Um, that all this, all this is made up. Why? Because that gets them off the hook and makes them feel like, oh yeah, we can continue to be in favor of the choice of killing a baby. Right. But yeah, Father, let, let's take everyone back just for a minute, because like we said, people don't realize the truth about Norma's journey. Yeah. And so now she's pregnant with baby number three, right? Uh, knows that she doesn't want to have another baby right now. Of course, at the time, she couldn't have gotten an abortion in Texas, Dallas, Texas, where she lived. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, I mean, she went to, she was starving, basically, basically living in the park. I forget the name of the park in Dallas, because uh, basically her mother at that time had told her to get out of the house, so to speak, because uh, she was already raising the other babies, uh, the other baby, uh, her daughter Melissa. And um, she basically, Norm, um, Sarah Weddington found out about the, they were looking, Sarah and Linda Weddington and Linda Coffey were looking for, someone to start an abortion case and they were just lawyers at a law school at the time so they have to go back right and i think father wasn't this like 1970 when this whole began right late 60s yeah. late 60s yeah. actually and first of all they knew darn well norma was already a couple like a couple months pregnant when they stumbled upon her and they knew darn well they couldn't get her an abortion in time you know right they weren't going to be able to help her at all and uh, she was very hungry, so they offered to buy her some lunch, and they had pizza. She always talks about the fact that at that pizza lunch, she signed on the dotted line. Cause yeah, said, Norma, why did, you, uh, why did you meet up with uh, Sarah or anything? Because I was hungry. Because I was hungry. She That's told what us she, that so many times. Oh, my gosh, so many times in interviews, she said, because I wanted food. I was hungry, you know. And, of course, now think about this. And I want our audience out here to think about this. You, hire, you, you sign to hire a lawyer for whatever case it is. Don't you have contact with that lawyer throughout the period of the case while it's going through the courts? Now, this case went through the local courts in Dallas, and then eventually it, it went to the and Supreme it went, Court It jumped twice. right to the Supreme Court. But yeah. it went twice. Well, they heard it twice. They yeah. heard it twice. The oral arguments. The oral twice. arguments. Because there was a change on the court. There was a change yeah. on the court, so they heard it twice. But in all those years, from the late 60s to 73, Norma ne never saw Sarah Weddington again. Norma never spent one day in court. There's another fact. How many people know that? Not one day did she spend in court. Mm. And now you win. Your attorney wins a case for you. Don't they pick up the phone and call you and say, hey, we won. Victory. No. 
Sarah Wennington, on January 22nd, 1973, Sarah Wennington never even contacted Norma McCorvey. In fact, Norma found out when she opened the door and picked up the Dallas paper and saw the story. And she told the person she was living with at the time, hey, you know what? And the person said, what? You see that person they're talking about? That's me. And her friend said, yeah, and I'm the Queen of England. Exactly. And, that's, <laughs> and now that story, by the way, that's from Norma's lips. That's listen, exactly listen. how she let me, let me put, I want to put just a few things in context here. Um, you and I got to know Norma in 1995. That, 95, that's when, yeah. first of all, she, what you described happened. The Roe v. Wade case came down. Nobody knew who the Jane Roe was. No. And the... Um, pro-abortion movement recruited her. She worked in a couple of abortion facilities herself. But the pro-abortion movement recruited her to come out and reveal her identity. Right. And, I want to, and I have two books here. When she did reveal her identity, this book came out called I Am Roe. Right. My Life, Roe v. Wade, and Freedom of Choice, okay? And then... Well, of course, that Norma said to me, well, I never wrote that book. Yeah, no, of course she not. She said to me, right. I didn't write one word of it. I sat and talked to someone, and then they came out and with the And they wrote book, it, right. And they wrote it. <laughs> um, then the second book, the story of, of her conversion to pro-life and to Christ, One by Love, mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a third smaller booklet that she wrote together with me, My Journey, My Journey into, into the Catholic, Catholic Church. Church. Right. But it, it, this was interesting. On the day uh, that they were having this big press conference, and um, Glor uh, attorney Gloria Allred, uh, pro-abortion uh, fanatic uh, that she is, uh, arranges this press conference for Norma. And um, you know what Norma says to her um, privately uh, uh, just before uh, becoming um, known as the Roe of Roe v. Wade? She says, um, she says, you know, um, I think abortion is wrong. I think abortion is wrong. And, 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 and I wanna, wanted to reference that because the American people are conflicted about abortion. Right. They see the arguments on both sides. That we are people of life, we love babies, we are people who love freedom and the ability to, of self-determination. So the American people are conflicted about abortion. Norma was conflicted too. She was conflicted about abortion while she was pro-abortion. Right. Because she wasn't pro-abortion. No. She said, I, I think abortion is wrong. She was co-opted into this support for abortion precisely for the reasons you just mentioned and precisely because she was the kind of person who at the same time, and let's give people a little bit of insight into her, right. into her personality. Mm -hmm. At the mm -hmm. same time, she could be led in one direction or another. And then both and go But out then the always maintain a fierce right. independence. Yes. She was the kind of person that if you, if you tried to help her with something. You could something, only help her so only much. Only so much. So much. You come within a certain radius. And then she put the wall radius. up. Yes. <laughs> And everyone on the other side, first of all, her conflicts with the other side, remember that hearing that she, she participated in bef in front of Congress once she was, it was known who she was. She was sitting there in this panel with all these pro-abortion leaders. Right. And they all were introducing themselves and they got to Norma and they, and, and ma'am, could you state your, your name and who you are? Right. Yes, I'm Norma McCorvey. Right. I'm the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade. And these other ladies, they wish they were. <laughs> you know, this was, and that sort she of. She had this sense of humor, like where she would just blurt out whatever she thought. Sense of humor. You know. And also a <laughs> sense of, of, there was tension between right. her and these pro abortion leaders. They right. didn't have much use for her. No. And she didn't have much respect for them. No. No, oh, they just wish they were. That well, was her she, attitude. She used to call them the cast of characters. Yeah, well, we would always talk about that. Yeah, the she cast of characters. The cast of characters that took advantage of me. Yeah. Um, and then I, I also remember, too, the stories of when she did work in the abortion clinic, especially yes. the one that she worked in that was right next to Operation Rescue Flip Venom. Yes. And that clinic, I remember her saying stories like, well, yeah, they, they kind of were getting to the point, I think, where they would like to fire me or get rid of me because uh, I would ask the girls, well, do you really think you need an abortion? Right. Do you know what they're going to do to do that you know baby? What, do you know what they're going to do to the baby? They're going to tear gonna the happen? baby apart, our, our right. arms she and goes, the legs. I don't know. And then, of course, 
they would get furious with her for being honest. But just because she asked the question, are you sure you want an abortion, right? So she was like saying, like, you don't, have, don't feel pressured into this now, honey. If you don't want it, you can leave now. Yeah. Well, see, now, and, and it's important that we're bringing, friends, the reason that we're bringing this out is for someone to come along and say, well, you know, her rejection of abortion was just an act because it was paid for by the Christian right and the pro-life movement was forking her all kinds of money. Well, then how do you explain what she said and what she did when she wasn't part of the pro-life movement? That's right. She was far more honest about abortion yes. than the people around her that were holding her up as a pro-abortion trophy were. That's right. And they, you know, even Gloria Ulrich, she was willing to say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm not going to respond to this, oh, I think abortion is wrong thing. I've got her here. She's going to add the lights are on, the cameras are on. She's the Jane Rover over your way. So oh, we're just going to go with that, you know, and right. we'll, we'll, t we'll kind of keep the rest that day. That was the relationship. Right. And uh, Norm, so the American people are conflicted about abortion. Norma was conflicted about abortion. Here's a, the, the first thing, too, that we should say about her rejection of Roe v. Wade is that it was a rejection of Roe v. Wade. In other words, a decision that most people still don't know how extreme it is, right. that it permits abortion throughout pregnancy. Yeah. All nine months. Throughout pregnancy. All nine months, right. Now, Norma never bought into that, but she was the symbol of that. But when she rejected that, she rejected that for life. Right. Because there aren't very many of the American people that don't reject that. Right. But you really think that a healthy baby carried by a healthy mother who can survive outside the womb and who's in the you know, seventh, eighth, or ninth month of their development should be able to be, you know, dismembered and killed, mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to find many people saying yes to that. The no. statistics show that. Mm -hmm. This is a rejection of Roe v. Wade. And Norma said to us, you know, uh, you know and, and again, let, 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 let's make this clear. I think it's just offensive and absurd that somebody <laughs> sweeps in at the end of her life with television cameras and microphones and stenographer pads and gets cozy, cozy with Norma and tries to rewrite what we lived through 22 years of personal history. That's right. You don't get to do that. And that's why, Jenna, I want to focus for a moment here, too, on the, the um, uh, this was a journey. This wasn't just a person who was taking a position or answering an interviewer's question. No about Roe v. Wade or whether abortion should be legal. What do you think about abortion or what do you think about the pro-lifers? No. This was a person with deep wounds who struggled to find some healing and some peace. Now, these were not things. Whatever people are going to say, and we'll have a lot more to say when we see this, this, this documentary. Oh, yeah. I'm going to say it. But, but, but whatever people want to say about, uh, oh, yeah, you know, she, you know, I put on an act, you know. <laughs> she, said, uh, she said a lot of things to us about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the acts that she put on with the with the pro-abortion people, um, and uh, but again, you don't see this through an interview or a conversation. You see it through two decades of the ups and downs of a wrestling with your own pain that we saw for our with our own eyes, oh, yes. and including that Rachel's Vineyard retreat. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, you, you would say, like, what led her to go on a Rachel's Virginia retreat with me? We were there together. You were there, Dr. Teresa Burr. Well, and this is, this is the world's largest ministry for healing after abortion. This is conducted in a confidential setting. Right. This is a very, very demanding and vigorous psychological, spiritual process of right. facing the evil that you've been involved in, facing mm -hmm. your wounds, and finding healing. Uh, it operates as, as one of our ministries, and Dr. Teresa Burke is a psychologist that founded this. So, Well, and Norma, you know, like I said, you just said, she was very disturbed over the years about her being the person who was used, basically signature, to start this whole thing. She wanted it overturned. She worked with Alan Parker and Alan Parker, the Justice Foundation, to 
and Sandra Kano, who also was the Doe of Doe v. Bolton, to, mm -hmm. to both ladies wanted to overturn the, the cases. And it just haunted Norma's constantly about all these babies, you know, every, every day are dying. It dying. haunted her. Yes. She wasn't paid to have nightmares. No, no. She wasn't co-opted to shed tears. Right. She wasn't pretending to be burdened. She was burdened by She this. was burdened. She was very burdened. Uh, she used to tell me sometimes about the nightmares she would have and the stories. And so you and I were doing a Rachel's Vineyard retreat with, with some others who were, I guess you would say, in more leadership roles. It wasn't just the average person. So we said, well, Norma, even though you haven't had an abortion, Teresa Burke said you could still come and you could memorialize your pain because you and don't the have to have an abortion to be to, on to go through the process. It's, it's aggressive. It's right. grieving. It's, it's a grieving. process of grieving. So she, she did go on that retreat, and I'll remember there was a certain point that the the grief, the pain as she was going through it all became so intense that she ran out of the room. And Teresa Burke and I went I can after see, her. I can, I can, I can still see her running out running. of that chapel. She was, out of was the, the chapel, chapel. right? Yeah. And uh, of course, we spent some time talking to her, consoling her the tears that were flowing. Uh, and by the time we got to the end of the whole weekend, Norma had made a giant leap. And she did say, while I'll never fully feel the burden lifted, I feel like I took a step. And, and what she said was that up to that point, when she was going around speaking, she, she called her ministry, Row No More. Right. But then after that weekend, She's, I remember her saying to me, Jan, you got to help me. One day she would call me. She, as a matter of fact, she, she used to tease. We had this teasing. She would call me woman of the East. I would call her woman of the West because I lived in New York and she lived in Dallas. And we were good friends. And so she's called me maybe the week after the retreat and said, all right, woman of, the, uh, woman of the East, you have to help me. I said, what? I can't be Roe No More Ministry. I said, okay, what do you want to do? Well, I've crossed over into a new life now. I, I've lifted this burden at least somewhat off of myself. So I want to be crossing over. I'm crossing over into this new life. I'm crossing over into uh, getting rid of this pain. And so that was the next name, Crossing Over Ministries, uh, that she came up with. And we helped to get a, like a basic little website mm -hmm, she started. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing, too, about Norma is, you know, the pro-life movement, I mean, I wasn't around when she first converted with Reverend Flip. I mean, I was working with you as a volunteer, basically. Yes. Um, but. She right away people did want to have her go speak at banquets and well you know, this back, is the knee back. jerk reaction right yeah uh, which is know. bad getting these people who convert right out on the road yeah. but I can remember you know people think right in and out because you have these speakers bureaus right uh, ambassadors you know is one of them where people get paid a nice sum of money and they handle all the details and all that but back in these days this was back in the nineties there were no speakers bureaus at least not in the pro life movement uh, and people would just find people and say, oh, get this person to speak. And so people would call Norma on the phone or her cell phone and invite her to speak. And she would go. And to be honest, Father, a lot of people, you know, they, they didn't pay a, a fortune of money. Norma didn't make a fortune of money out there on the speaker circuit. And a couple of times where she felt she just couldn't get on a plane one day, she called me and she said, okay, woman of these, I'm too sick. I can't get on the plane. Uh, I have a banquet this weekend. You need to step in and tell my story and sure enough that's what I remember the last minute I had to jump on a plane and I think I went to South Carolina and spoke at a, a banquet for her and I did it a few times um, but she she still had um, you know this pain in her of while well, she took steps to heal she still had I think a sense of, of, of guilt that my gosh you know it goes back to the playground story the empty playgrounds there's a lot of that stuff you know about and over out there but mm -hmm. but then near her, the end of her life um, as you know, <clears throat> she suffered from COPD, for those who don't know uh, Norma's illness. And um, she she actually died, you know, young, you consider, you know, uh, age um, for a woman. 69. But 69. And, um, <clears throat> you know, she, um, like I said, she was my older, like my older sister. Uh, and um, near the end there, you know, she, she, first of all, she kept her faith right to the end. You know, a priest came, she belonged to a parish, and she eventually moved from Dallas to Katy, Texas, uh, by her daughter, Melissa. And she, um, <clears throat> eventually, uh, Melissa got her into an assisted living place. 
and um, and then eventually, and you know what? Just to show how conflicted and crazy things don't would come out of Norma's uh, mouth. I remember one day she called me. Don't you remember? She was so upset that <clears throat> Melissa got me into this place, and I have a nice apartment and everything, but she stole my money. Remember, she said Melissa stole her money, which wasn't the case. Melissa did all the paperwork with social services to get her into assisted living. But Norma, again, like you said before, Father, when you start helping her a little too much, then she gives you pushback. And even to her own daughter, she was like, look what Melissa did to me. I said, and I had, we had to explain to her, Norma, Melissa didn't do anything terrible. She got you a better place to live, didn't she? And she says, yes, Janet. I said, well, she didn't take your money. You don't even have that much see, money. See, yeah. and this is, a, this is <laughs> one of uh, about 10,000 stories uh, oh my gosh, we, we could tell. tell. Yeah. But I want to I help people to understand, to get this little glimpse into the fact that Norma was very, uh, not only very wounded, but very, she could be very reactive yes. to the wound. Yes. I mean, I never had a conversation with her actually where we didn't end up laughing. And I, right. and I think you had the same experience. Right. Uh, At the end. <laughs> she was able to to find um, humor in life right. and things to laugh about, but there was always also that wound, and you know, she would go into situations like this where she, you know, would look at what somebody did or what somebody said, and he, she would be. I wish she was on. You know, there were many conversations where she was just. We were just letting her. Her vent, you know, a little little volcano exploding, mm -hmm. and then would do just what you just said. Help her to see the perspective right. of what was really going on. Well, matter of fact, um, I don't have my cell phone here in the studio, but I saved on my cell phone one of her final like messages when she was angry at what Melissa or somebody was doing. Yeah, and I just saved it for the fun of it because yeah. I thought oh, this is typical Norma lashing out at somebody, <clears throat> her own daughter mm -hmm. who's helping her. Um, and, and then after she calms down a bit, you can point out, and then she would say, oh, okay, I get it. All right, they were trying to help me. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> right, right, you know, right. That's the way she would be, you know, uh, all the time. So from what I understand, I, I haven't seen this documentary yet, uh, but from what I understand, someone uh, offered her some money uh, the last maybe year of her life uh, to do a story about her life. Now again, remember that Norma was on a, a public assistance in assisted living. So if you're going to offer her some money, even if it's a small amount, she's going to think this is good. Mm -hmm. And so they probably just let the camera roll and let her talk. And like we said, she can be very incoherent at times when jumping from this thought to that thought. Well, if you have a good editor and you get a whole string of, of her babbling, well, I could piece it together and probably make it look like it, what it really wasn't like. Mm -hmm. It's very simple to do. You know how they could take people out of time the sound bites of the world. They take one little phrase out of context and it looks like the person said something else and that's not what they really said when you hear the whole phrase of what they said. Mm -hmm. But they take one little snip out and it, it just changes, you know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. listen, Father, we, we spoke to her the day she died. That's right. We were in Rome on a business trip and uh, Melissa called us, her daughter, <clears throat> to let us know that death was imminent. You know, her, her uh, respiratory, respiration was uh, shallow in her breathing. And uh, I remember her distinctly saying to us, make sure, Father and Janet, you keep trying to overturn my case. Please, overturn Roe, please. I can't live to see that day. But please, Father, promise me you're going to keep doing it. You know, <clears throat> people might see, you know, these interview clips on a documentary. You didn't see the tears that she shed over Roe v. Wade That's right. over the years. You didn't see in the quiet, confidential settings the grief she endured and the pain she carried from having been the one who helped unleash abortion on America, which was never her intention. Um, it's, uh, it's like I say, if someone comes to you and says, you know, the sibling that you knew all your life was different from what you knew, you would say to them, who do you think you are trying to tell us this? And, and I think that's very much the, uh, the reaction to this, uh, uh, to this latest effort of the pro aborts to justify themselves. Are you looking at comments? I, I can't read them. I don't have my reading glasses on, Father. <laughs> I can't see them. Can you? I'm trying to see if this Yes, up. yes, I can. Yeah. Oh, because well, otherwise I can't answer a question if I can't read it. I did bring my reading glasses into the studio, so... It's yeah. all blur to me. Yeah. No, but, you know, I think Norma would be very upset right now knowing She'd that have some curse words to say. <laughs> I'll tell you yeah. the truth. 
Yeah, uh, she could she curse like a truck driver she when would she wanted to. She would have some curse words to say. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, um, there's also a lot of fun stories to tell about Norma, you know, sweet stories. Um, she was very kind. Like I said, I had stayed in her home. She stayed in my home, you know, over the years. Um, I remember when I stayed in her home in Texas, her, she had this cat, Maxine. <laughs> And oh, I'm not a big fan of cats. Those who know me know that. And all of a sudden, Maxine is walking back and forth across the headboard. The headboard of the bed. Yeah, <laughs> I could just I could still see the cat there. See the cat there uh, walking back and forth. And uh, another funny thing is Norma loved bagels. Bagels. And you can't get a good bagel down in Texas. Mm. So I used to be her supplier. I used to, uh, every so often, she'd call me and say, okay, women of the East, I need some more bagels. I said, all right, Norma. And her two favorites was she loved the onion bagel and the everything bagel. And I used to put them in a FedEx box and ship them down to her. And uh, another thing, which, you know, Father, when she was in assisted living, she would she call me again one other day when she needed stuff, and I sent her some outfits and things, you know, like the new nightgowns and stuff. And she said, Jen, I'm I'm just my reading glasses hurt, my eyes hurt, I can't read my Bible. So I got her. Remember, we got her the big large print Bible. And I sent that down to her. So, I mean... Yeah, she wanted... Yeah, exactly. She wanted the Bible. You remember what she did in her spare time in those uh, those final years of her life when we would visit her uh, there at the home of Angie. Uh, right. Angie, who, who she lived with for, for three years just before she went into the um, assisted living um, facility. Remember what she was doing in a lot of her spare time there at the dining room table? Oh. Making rosaries. Oh, that's right. Now I remember by that. hand, by making hand. rosaries by hand. I, right. I could still see that. They had the the boxes of the different, you beads, know, yeah. beads and everything. And uh, well, and she was it, taught her how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and she loved doing yeah, it. She said, oh, did. Fine, I want to yeah. help people to pray. You know, she felt she herself found a lot of comfort in the rosary. She did. And in she fact, did. it was the rosary. You know, uh, just putting these th thoughts together. That was when I knew she wanted to become a Catholic mm -hmm. because. Uh, Going back to the to the mid '90s, right? And um, she would, um, well, well, I like I said, I first met her in '95, and she had, you know, Reverend Flip Benham had had baptized her, and uh, and in my travels into Dallas, you know, she would come sometimes when I was saying mass. Uh, and then there was the funny holy water story. Where oh, we that's the funny house. story. Tell people that story just as a little <laughs> in, a little interlude. Well, one of our trips to Dallas, um, you were there, Father, and uh, Norma said, oh, come over to my house. I want you to bless my house. Yeah. And so you had, I made you come right from the airport, so you didn't even have any holy water or anything with you. So you asked Norma, Norma, do you have any holy water? And she says, well, Father, no. Why? H how do you get it? Can, I, can we make holy water? <laughs> So I remember you saying how well, Norma, I'm a priest, so yeah, I can make holy water. So he, she's, you said, do you have a container of some sort? So she had this big jug with a lid on top, and you said, well, Norma, you know, you want that much holy water? She goes, oh yeah, that, that's that's good. I want to have a lot, Father. Who knows when you're coming back again? So she filmed the thing, and you did all the right rituals and the blessing, and then you blessed her home, and then she put the the, the holy water away. She put it in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what was it? I don't know. A couple of weeks later, I was on the later. phone with her. Yeah. yeah. And, and she said, uh, oh, Father, I need more holy water. <laughs> you said, Norma, what would you do with it? So tell them. <laughs> yeah, my friend and I, we forgot it was holy water. We drank it. <laughs> <laughs> right. She drank the holy water. Yeah. And so you said, all right, Norma, next time I come, or ask Father Robinson. He'll get you some more holy water. But you, you're not supposed to be drinking it. She goes, I promise, Father, I won't drink any more holy water. But <laughs> that was at the time when she was, you know, she... she she, she was, was interested journey. in Catholicism. Right. You know, she had a little smattering of it in her past. And uh, she would start asking me questions about right. the Mass and the faith. And I said, okay, I just answered her questions. I never said, oh, you should be a Catholic or anything no. like that. Um, we were together for pro-life events there in, in the mm -hmm. Dallas area. So then, um, one night when we were on, on a pro-life event together, we were in the car going from dinner to the event. She's sitting in the back seat. I'm in the front. And she says, Father Frank, she says, I have a question for you. Is there such a thing as a born-again Catholic? Because she had always heard, you know, Reverend Flip and our, our, our evangelical friends again. talking about right. being born again. It's, right. it's biblical is what Jesus said. That's right. And I said, well, yes, yes, of course there is. Yeah. I mean, Catholics are born again, too. We're all born again in Christ. Oh, you could be a born-again Catholic. Okay, okay. And that got me thinking, oh, she's really trying to piece together in her mind, mind. how Catholicism fits in, fits in with right. the Christianity that she was learning about, right? 
So mm -hmm. then, uh, the day that I uh, I realized she really seems to be on a journey. Well, first of all, we were together at that Human Life International conference. Right. And um, that was when it was in Houston, Texas. That yes, year. yes. And remember, that was the conference at which she came up to me privately in the hallway and she said, Father, I had a dream. I don't know how to interpret it. She said, uh, but the Lord said to me, um, I am going to be calling you home soon. And she said, what does this mean? You know, I'm afraid it means I'm, I'm going to die. die. Yeah, I, know she I was said, afraid. Norma, I don't know what it means. I said, but ask the Lord. Just yeah. ask him. Ask him. He'll yeah. reveal it to you. A week or two later, she emails me and I still have all these, these messages and everything. And she said, uh, Father, I, he revealed to me what it means. I, I, I'm, I'm meant to come into the Catholic Church. Wow. But it was it, 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 just before that she said, how do you say the rosary? That's when I realized she was on a journey. When, when you right. say, how do I say the rosary? Right. Well, then, you know, something is really happening Someone's there. Someone's clicking. And, and um, you know, what people don't realize, too, is that Father Robinson, who, you know, is now deceased, uh, is a Dominican, and he actually met with her every single week. She would go to the friary, the mm -hmm. priory uh, where he lived, and she would go for, for Bible study and spiritual lessons and, and about the faith. I mean, this is, uh, she didn't just one, two, three, say, oh, I think I want to become Catholic. This was a journey yeah. that she was on. And then she would be calling you and talking to you. I mean, extensive conversations of the faith and questions and questions and questions. She took it very seriously, and so, you know, her coming into the Catholic Church uh, was a journey, a journey. She, um, the last few times, you know, when she was no longer doing interviews, but wanted to convey messages to pro-life gatherings, I would often bring messages from her to pro-life gatherings. Right. In that very last, those last months of her life, you know what she would often say was, uh, tell the young people, the young people, to keep on this cause, right. to, to keep defending their even younger brothers and sisters. She wanted to see the involvement. She was very encouraged to see the involvement of the young people in the pro-life movement oh, yeah. and wanted to explicitly urge them. Those right. were some of her last messages to the movement. But, well, and, and the people who were with her when she died, of course, her daughter Melissa was there. Our good friend Karen Garnett was there at the hospice the day she died because they were the ones who helped, because she said, call Father Frank. Um, she had her rosary in her hands. Yeah, and she always clung to her faith. She and, clung to her faith. This is not a woman yeah. who on her deathbed switched positions. You know what I mean? No, no she way. did not. We can say categorically. Categorically, we know Nor that. was she putting on an act. You know, you're not putting on an and act. And when we spoke when to her you father, go through, I thought back about that night. We were in Rome, so the diff time difference between Rome and, and Dallas was, you know, it was, for us, it was, we were going into evening mass. It was a vigil mass around 6 o'clock in the evening, and um, she died. We spoke to her right before we went into mass. I, mm -hmm. can see, I could see it like it happened yesterday. We were in the back seat of a car. We were driven. Uh, actually, we were with our good friend Joan Lewis from EWTN uh, Rome Bureau. And uh, we were on our way to this church, and we got dropped off. We, were, we said goodbye to Norma because we were going into church, and we said, we'll call you as soon as we're at a mass again. And I remember her saying something like, I may not be here, Father. You know, she could barely talk to us and breathe. And uh, sure enough, she passed away at the moment of the consecration. Because when we came out of church, of course, my, I put my phone back on, and it, it was blowing up. It was Melissa and Karen calling us to say Norma had passed. And we didn't get to enjoy that dinner too much with Joan because all the media were trying to get comments from us. And, That's right, uh, well, for the rest of the night. Yeah, and, uh, literally the rest literally. of the night. <laughs> and, and, of course, well, yeah. for Because we were in Rome. We, we were in Rome. We were six hours yeah. ahead. Yeah, and then, of course, we did go to her funeral. I, 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 I celebrated the funeral. Yeah. I, was, I led the funeral and preached, uh, preached the homily. At and, her uh, request. At yep. her request. Yeah. So again, you and we know, had pro-life leaders there. For, oh, there were so many pro-life leaders there at her funeral. So for a woman who switched, like they're claiming on her deathbed, why did she want to talk to her one of her, well, her favorite be, priests? Well, there's going to be know. a number of ridiculous claims being made and twisting of her words. First of all, that somehow or another she uh, she uh, changed her mind yet again. 
Uh, secondly, that somehow she had never changed her mind and right. was putting on an act. Uh, so then was she putting on an act with Gloria Allred when she said she thought abortion was wrong or when she uh, actually saved lives in the abortion clinic where she was working right. because she was telling those women the what truth. the abortionists would not tell them. Right. She you would know, tell they, the they, truth. They're the liars. This is why they always accuse people of lying or they want to paint a story of everyone's lying. Yeah. Because that's what they do. Mm -hmm. That's what they do yeah. all the time. That's their their profession is to lie. And then they and then and then some people say, oh, that she 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 was paid. This is the most ridiculous thing that she was paid by us to be pro life. We were <laughs> we were struggling to help her. Right. She wasn't. You know, we, we were we were. Um, first of all. We wanted to make it clear to her that she could not rely on the pro-life movement for her sustenance. Right. That goes back to what you were saying before, that, mm -hmm. that you know, she would obviously get all these speaking engagements and whatnot. And at a certain point, we were realizing, you know, she can't keep up with this. No. You know, you're flying here and there and changing time zones and keeping, a, you know, sleeping in, in, in strange places and, and, and uh, always uh, on call and whatnot. I said, you, 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 you can't, you can't do it. And she would say, well, you know, if I, you know, if I don't do the speaking, you know, how am I going to make a living? And, uh, you know, we said to her, well, first of all, your, your story is out there. You don't have to end up killing yourself to keep just because it. this is a, right. this is a job, a job. It's a source of, of some sustenance because, I mean, people invite you to come out to speak, they're going to pay your airfare, they're going to put you up at, in a hotel, and they're going to give you a stipend for the event. That's what we all do, uh, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what, like you say, speakers, bureaus, this is what... But know, back when she was doing it, she wasn't on speakers. any... Well, well we speakers. were doing it for a while, a arranging or, 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 you know, right. interfacing between her and the groups that were trying to invite her, but we were also making clear, you know, to her that, listen, your story is out there in writing, you don't in video, you don't have to be going out there personally, right. And uh, as far as sustenance, you know, you're not alone. If you don't have a means of income, you know, you're not alone. We will help you when there's a legitimate need. There were right. bills of hers that we got people to help to pay. To pay. Right. But, um, you know, it's amazing how people that don't share our values will twist that and uh, try to make it look like... Uh, it was made up. I'm sure a lot of you would have questions. So listen, we're, we see the comments coming in here. Some of you are on Facebook. Some of you are on Periscope. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, talk to us, friends, and, uh, because we want to clarify for you a little bit more about all this. My phone is here, and pro-life leaders are calling me. And you know, this, is, this, is, this is ridiculous. Uh, well, you know, know, like I said, I, I haven't seen the documentary, but I guarantee you they have taken footage over the years. As a matter of fact, if they want to see some footage of Norma, we have at Priest for Life well, a special page. Yes. Uh, Priestforlife.org slash Norma. Norma, right. Uh, in fact, because of being stuck in with the, the, uh, this quarantine, uh, over the years, Father Frank and I have interviewed Norma several times. We did it way back in the 90s when she first converted. Uh, you and know. then throughout the 2000s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But th when she first converted, we, she, we had her on Defending Life on EWTN. Then Father Pavone and I did a show called uh, Gospel of Life, and we interviewed her twice there because we used to film that show down in Texas. Right there our, in, yeah. In, in yeah. Uh, Denton, Texas at Life Dynamics, our good friend Mark Crutch's place. And so Norma would come over every so often. We would, we would interview her. But, you know, Father, I wanted to bring out a point about Norma speaking. If she went out on her own to speak and had to give a talk, a lot of people would say, oh my gosh, she's not that good of a speaker. Oh my gosh, it's so... Uh, she rambled. She rambled. What we found the best formula was you had to kind of lead her along, meaning you asked her one question, a brief question, and then she would answer that question. Then yeah. you'd go to the next part that you wanted to know and you'd ask her the next question. And if you did that, she was wonderful. And if they go to our website, yeah, priestforlife.org slash Norma, we do have the footage up there yeah. of these Well, I would interviews. like to actually, uh, our, our, our studio uh, techs here could get the, uh, the interview footage. The interview, we have three interviews of Norma that we recently 
showed. showed. And we can show those this afternoon, you know, right. for people to watch. But we'll we'll uh, but see. Let let let's see what some of these comments are. Somebody was just saying it. Just comment just went to the bottom of the page. Um, uh, okay, so first of all, one of our friends here watching on YouTube. So what do I tell someone that says it was an act? Tell her the people who know her best know better. No, it, it wasn't was no an act. act. You right. don't you don't put on an act right. when the things that you know, if you're going to put on an act, you know, and sustain it for 22 years. 22 years that we knew her in good times and in bad, in public and in private, in happiness and in sadness. Like right. I said at the outset of this program, if you have a sibling and someone comes to you a few years after they died and starts telling you a completely different story, you know that you know that person. Right. And like I said, that, that's, she stayed at my home in, in Staten Island, New York. I stayed in her home in Dallas, we Texas. Were, she was like a sister to us. Like we a were sister. with her for 22 years. Sometimes she years. shared my hotel room with me when we were out at a pro-life conference. I mean, we You take shared, it from the source. Oh, who my said, goodness. Who's saying that she put uh, uh, on an act? Somebody who got her to say that in front of a camera. Uh, a a uh, clip uh, when that she's, they edited up and put in, uh, together? Uh, yeah, and even if, no. you, even if you didn't edit it. The fact of the matter is that it's the journey she made that tells the story. That's right. It's the journey. You the don't journey. fake the kind of pain that I was one of her, her, her spiritual counselors. You don't fake the kind of pain that leads you through a, 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 a journey of healing that, you know, you have to face. Anybody would run away from this. You don't pretend to go through something like that. No. The process itself right. smokes you out. Mm -hmm. You know, this is an intensive psychological and spiritual yeah. process. Um, somebody, uh, somebody was saying, uh, um, she, uh, um, somebody said that she was paid. Rob Shank said the same thing. What do you mean oh, she was paid? Well, first of all, uh, let's go back to Rob Shank for just a quick moment, because Rob Shank has gone over to the other side recently, as you know. And so whatever Rob said, she paid, paid by Yeah, food. yeah. It's like, let's, let's pause on that and think about right. that for a moment. Uh, fill in the blank you know so and so said she was paid or norma said she was she was uh, paid. paid um paid for for what for what to give a talk at to a, give a, talk, a banquet? You, you don't think we are too right hey listen oh wait we're how paid much, wait, 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 wait we don't how believe much, we don't much, believe wait how much does hillary clinton get paid when she goes out or obama yeah, or you, this you, one you, or that you, one you, paid. you know because nobody should get paid for anything <laughs> right that's the, I mean, and first of all, the amount of money that she got paid back in the 90s, so she gave a talk at a banquet. My God, brothers and sisters, it was a couple of hundred bucks plus an we helped she her was, We helped her pay her bills. We helped her pay her bills. She would call sometimes and say, Janet, Father Frank, I, I don't have enough money to pay my electricity. So, so, so now you're damned if you do, you're damned if yeah, you don't. Yeah, because I would say, because if we ignore no, her, how much is the electric bill? Yeah. And she would say, like, oh, $150. I said, okay, don't worry. Well, I'm, I'll make you out a check. We'll FedEx it. You'll have it tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and so we would send just a little bit extra, like, oh, she needs 150 We'll send her 200 so she has right. a little bit extra. So, you know, so, so on the one hand, you don't <laughs> want someone to be destitute. Right. Because if they're your friend and right. if they're in your movement and you ignore them, then the story would be, you know, these people, they Oh, they, they abused her. They, they, yeah. couldn't, they didn't couldn't even help less. her. Right. They didn't even help right. her. Right. And then when you help her, it's like, oh, well, you know, you just paid her to be pro-life. That is so, so absurd. Ridiculous. First of all, it, it, they act like for 22 years we had her on the payroll or a salary. Absolutely not. We would send her gifts, gifts now and then when she needed it, as she needed it. It wasn't like, uh, oh, please. I mean, seriously. Yeah, look at Steve Rhodes. Hey, Steve, you better be careful, Steve. What? He, we helped her pay her bills. They admit they paid her. <laughs> You oh, see, oh, now this one, is, one electric yeah. bill. Yeah. One electric bill, Steve. One electric bill in 22 years. I mean, all it meant well, Who the was, hell is this, Steve? Oh, my, who the heck are you, Steve? I mean, what we're saying is when she had needs throughout those 22 years, if she called us, we gave her a helping hand. You don't give a, a cousin, a friend, a helping hand? Yeah. How many people have all of you lent a few bucks look, to? Look, look, look. Well, here's our, our communications director is sending a, a message. A documentary claims she was paid $450,000. Yeah, right. Somebody gave her a check. Norma, if you say yeah. you're pro-life, we're going to give you... Yeah. No. Yeah. And uh, on First the other who hand... Has, who has that you, kind of money? If you, you look at laugh. someone who's giving talks in, in a movement right. over 25, over the quarter of a century, you're giving talks as part of a movement, you don't think if you add up what people paid 
to invite you to fly across the country, you know, get on a plane, stay at a hotel for three nights, you know, speak at yeah, a banquet. Father, she didn't, you know, and you she add didn't that make up that over, kind of money. No, no way. she did. There's no way. That no she, way. First of yeah, all, but what are they? No, no, what no. are they counting up? First of all, all the all the paid, but all even, the payments of all the trips of 25 years. No, but first of all, it wasn't even that amount of money because first of all, if you knew Norma McCorvey, she drove a jalopy of a car. That car was when I oh saw that gosh. car in that driveway. When she used to said, drive me around, I used to think, this? Norma, is this car? We were not get, safe we to, to get into it. We didn't feel safe getting so into she, it. Uh, so if if she was paid to be pro life for 22 years. She would have had a much nicer car, number one. She had a very small, almost like a cottage home in Dallas. Yeah, no, that it, was, it was incredible. Eventually she lost, and she, yeah. that's why she and went listen, to go live with Angie. Exactly. And listen, let's set the record straight. This is good that some, some of these uh, folks are coming on here that want to, so, some folks are coming on because they want to hear the truth. Right. But look at Steve again. Operation Rescue also paid her because she worked Worse for them. <laughs> She worked for them. Look at the stupidity, she, she, right, wait, Steve. You wait, really got to come on live here, come Steve, on, because come you, on, Steve. you're really an idiot. She had a job. They hired her. Okay, because this happened. Because that's not permitted she in this quit, movement. No, no, no. She quit working right next door to the abortion clinic. She was on the verge, probably getting fired, because she kept telling the women the truth. Yeah. She met Flip Benham and and the little girl Emily and the others, and went right, to church. So right. she decided, you know what? the heck with these people. I'm not going to wait till they kick me out. I'm going to go next door. She go, and then she went next door. She goes, okay, if I'm not working there, what are you guys going to do for me? And so Flip Benham said, well, Ms. Norm, we're going to we'll give, give you, you a job. We'll give you yeah. a job. So I think she was the receptionist. She answered the phone at Operation Rescue and they paid her to W-O-R-K, work. And hey, you, Steve, don't you get paid to work? You know, and uh, this is amazing. Oh, this but this is, is so what we're gonna, ridiculous. This is what we're going to see. And I, that, but you oh. get paid by Priest Life. So do I. So do, what, 50 other people? Oh, my and goodness. And you know what? Mm, someday someone's going to make a documentary about us that we were, we were paid pro-life. To be be pro-life. pro-life. We were paid to be paid pro-life. Paid to be pro-life. Oh, does that mean that OSC is uh, paid to be a, a, an abortion-loving uh, liberal? You huh? mean AOC? AOC, yeah. yeah. Is she being paid? She's paid. I think she's she gets paid. paid. Oh, she does get paid. She's in Congress, so they get paid quite a bit. I think priests get paid to be priests, too. <laughs> bishops get paid to be big salaries. Bishops get paid, paid to, to be, be bishops. bishops. Yeah, mm. right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Hey, I don't know. Give me a break. But, you know, um, like I said, um, Norma, you know, she was a very interesting character. And I don't think there's a person that she knew that she didn't at one time get mad at. I'm not talking to you now. She got mad at us. Oh, pfft. Yeah, and then I, the phone would, I used to say, all right, well, Father, Norma yelled at me again. He said, ah, yeah, okay, give her, yeah. give her in a few days or a few weeks. Then in the, I get a phone call. That's why I said before at the outset, right. we've been with her in all the ups and downs. Ups and downs. And some of the downs were, were against us, too. Oh, you know, it's yeah. like this was a person who, I mean, first of all, anybody, you know anybody for 22 years. Right. You're gonna be. Th- you're gonna go through just about everything, right? right? Exactly. Um, unless it's a very superficial relationship. This was not a superficial relationship that no. we had with her. No. And. Um, but she would get mad and yell, and I would always try to reason with her. And sometimes, sometimes you could reason with her, but sometimes you couldn't. But I knew when I was back in her good graces, when the phone would ring and I would hear, "Hi, women of the east, it's bagel time again." <laughs> <laughs> so I knew then. Okay, she was o- what over whatever got her upset. And now we could talk again, you know. So uh, I love Norma McCorvey. I loved her dearly. And um, on one of, the, one of my early trips to Dallas, she actually told me she had to make me a Texan. And she took me shopping for cowboy boots and a cowboy hat, which I still have. I still have them at home. And, uh, you know, of course, I paid for them and bought them, but she picked them out. And so I had my, my Texas boots and my cowboy hat mm-hmm. from Norma. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just think it's, it, it would, I know it would pain her very much to know that they they kind of took whatever footage they had and they they switched it up and whatever they've done to it i don't know i haven't seen it but i think it would hurt her very much to see what they've done mm-hmm. because you know the people who were with her at the very end i mean like i said karen garnett was there um her daughter melissa was there we spoke to her i mean it had to be no more than a half hour to 40 minutes before she actually passed away uh, so this was not a woman that flipped, changed her mind or anything else. She was a faithful Catholic, a faithful pro-lifer till the last breath. She, she actually hated 
people that pretended. For people to say she's a pretender, that's really, um, that conveys such an utterly profound ignorance right. of Norma. Of Norma. This that's is right. exactly the thing she hated. Right. That's why she sat on that panel. Yeah, these are the ladies. They want to be the, the, I'm the Jane Roe of Roe v. Wade, but they just want to be, you know. Right. I mean, she, she was a woman of sometimes harsh honesty. Oh, yeah. This is why she, in, the, in the abortion clinic, again, she was on the <coughs> pro-abortion side. She was working in the abortion clinic. Oh, I think for, what's that little three-letter word when you work in a place and they give oh, you? Oh, job. Pe- Pay. 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 She was paid. Pay. She, was, she paid. was paid by whom? The abortion clinic. The abortion clinic. Oh, yeah. Where she worked. So anyway, brutal honesty. So all she did was she stopped getting the paycheck from the abortion clinic, and then she started getting the paycheck from her from, new job. From her new job, yeah. J-O-B, job. But to say <laughs> that that's why a person takes a moral position that's crazy. on an issue of such fundamental importance is, let's say it what it is, because we see it in society, we see it in politics, we see it against President Trump, we see it in the church, we see it against us, I see it against me. It's two words that describe the sin that we're gonna we're about to see committed over and over publicly. AOC, it's a sin that you commit. It's a sin that all kinds of people commit. Rash judgment. Judgment. That's right. Rash judgment. Let's just take hook, line, and sinker, something we hear about another person that says how crooked they were, how dishonest they were, how insincere they were. How do we all fall into rash judgment so easily? How do we do it? How do we do it? Um, it, it, it's one of the most common uh, sins. Um, so, uh, let's see. You have uh, to read the comments, but I, I don't have my reading glasses with me. Uh huh. <laughs> so you'll have the to Norma. Read. Oh, this George is making an interesting comment. The Norma McCorvey Fusion GPS Steel dossier. That's good. That's uh, that's oh good. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Let's see here. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Yes, that is, right. that is a, a, an important commandment that it might be a good idea for... See, and this is where, you know, journalists, like we said, like this afternoon, you know, the LA Times and some other publications online coming out with these things. And, you know, it's not like they were saying, hey, there's going to be a documentary, you know, in which the creators of it claim, claim. that this right. and that and the other was said. No, the headlines are already, well, Norma was just, she really didn't convert. She really well, didn't. Well, also, Friends, too, Father, you know, it doesn't, ma- it doesn't matter what a person is going to say at any point in time, at any point in time. Right. Like, what I'm trying to say here is, you get Norma McCorvey on camera saying something, that's a snapshot of what she's saying that moment on camera. Right. We were there for the journey. That's right. We were there for the journey. And, you know, this is something, this is where you get to know what's really going on. Well, I mean, what happened to fair and balanced reporting? I mean, this documentary is coming out and you hear what it's about. If you're a good reporter, then don't you want to interview people on both sides to, to kind of weigh out? What's going on? I didn't hear our phones ringing well, and from it the isn't press. Even, and it isn't hey, LA even Times, would you like to interview us? And uh, interview Karen Garnett, interview her daughter Melissa. Yeah. Let's like make the list. Why don't you interview people who actually knew her over an extended period of time? Yeah, they quote the documentary. That's their their level of their level of journalistic research right. here is quoting the documentary. Right? right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really that's really deep. That's that, profound. That's, that's profound. Yeah, you know, and and it's a question of, and it's not even you know, like you said, people. It's not even just. About being of both sides of the issue. Right. I'm talking about personal knowledge. Right. Mm-hmm. We have the respect of relationships to talk to the people who had the relationships. That's what this comes down to. Did she convert honestly and sincerely to the pro life position? As sure as we're sitting here. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The, 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 the things she sacrificed, the hell that she went through, the journey. And remember, 
We're talking about people who guided her through a spiritual and psychological journey. We're talking about a priest counseling someone spiritually. Unless you want to say that our whole profession is a, is a fake, and that's, of course, what some people do believe. Of course. But unless you're ready to say that and believe that, you've got to give some weight to the fact that we walked this journey with her. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on camera that, that this unfolded. No. It was in the private places. It was in her home. It was in her church. It was on the Rachel's Vineyard retreat. It was in the confidential emails and the conversations. Not over three hours, not over a thousand hours of interviews, not over the last three years of her life or the last year. Over two Many, and a half yeah, decades. decades. Right. Two and a half so, decades. you know, it would be nice. It would be nice to people to pay a little bit of respect. So it's like how many of these people that now are are trying to say this are going to be, you know, or did come to what did we was I asleep when they called? Was no, I, Father, was they, I didn't, asleep? they didn't I wasn't the asleep. No, they didn't call oh. to interview you or me or Karen Garnett, or I can make the nice long list of people who knew her in those final days of her life on earth. No phone calls to any of us, none yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Well, because it, investigative, investigative reporting, they do zero. Yeah, Zippo. you see, and zero. Steve still doesn't get it, because this what's is what, say, oh, see, this Steve? is. I can't but, read it, Father, no, but what's see, he but saying this now? Is where, but this is where, <laughs> this is where, this is, this is how this story is gonna unfold in the next few days. If they think Norma could lie on camera, then she could also have lied to them. For 22 years? Not when years? you know someone for 22 years and you're no. not on camera. Right. No, right. no, it doesn't no. work that way. 22 years, Steve. Not because, quick interview. Because, no, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not what you say on camera. It's a friendship. And it's not a lie. No one is saying that, it, that Norma lied. Right. What we're saying is what happened over 22 years of right. not lying. That's what we're talking about. Right. So, uh, yeah. I'm a good actress. Yes, yeah, yes. Who said that? Norma. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a good actress. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, that's the kind of flip answer she that's would what, say. That's what. That's exactly oh, come on. how she d talked. D d d remember the time <laughs> she used to call your father and say, "Oh, so father, what are the creatures doing?" She used to kid around about the animals, the the farm animals, and all that. Yeah, that's, that? right. that's right. And then one day she sent father. When I opened up the box, I said, "Father, you got a gift from Norma." He says, "What is it?" I open up the box. And it's this glass looking house, and inside is grass, and all these little miniature animals, right? Remember that? Farm animals. And I called Norma, I said, Hey, Norma. Hi, what are you, how you doing? I said, Good. I said, I got the gift. I'm bringing it to Father now. Oh, good, good. Hey, Father, how do you like now? You got your own set of little creatures. And you know how that started. We brought her out to, um, we brought her and Sandra Kane out. Now, that's another right. one that, yes. that we have to talk about. Um, no, we brought her, she came to my, um, uh, the commencement ceremony where I was mm -hmm. given an honorary doctorate right, at, at the Franciscan University mm -hmm. of Steubenville. Right. So we're out there um, driving either to or from the university and it was a lot of farm through the land. plains of Ohio right. there and uh, in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. And, um, and we're driving along and she's in the car and, Nor and Sandra Cano's in the car was the doe, the, the doe of Roe and Doe. Doe v. Bolton. We had them both in the car. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and we're just do, engaging in small talk, and we look out the window, and there's these these uh, animals yeah. grazing Cows on the hillside. And, and I and I and I said creature. I said, yeah, look at all these all the creatures there. And you and she started laughing at that, and and then it took it took so on a, a, a life, life of, of itself. itself. Yes. Hey, father, how are the creatures? How doing? are the creatures doing? So, so uh, she made a creature farm for you that you could have yeah, on, on display. Yeah. But we had thousands of these kinds of, of moments with um, yeah. with um, Norma. With Norma. And, uh, you know. Like I said, she would laugh, she would cry. You know, both emotions all the time, depending on her, what was going on in her life. And, um, and here's the bottom line. The first time I uh, spoke to her, when I first met her, I said, so you're the Roe of Roe v. Wade. And she said, no. She said, I was the Roe of Roe, Roe v. Wade. Wade. Right. I am now a new creation in Christ. Right. Right. That's not something to be taken lightly. Right. She lived that, she was faithful to that. Mm -hmm. And you know what else? 
it's the reje- again, it's the rejection of Roe that was at the core of this. The idea, and I think we have to use this opportunity, not only to tell Norma's story, as we've traced here now, and we'll show people the footage of her uh, interviews and whatnot, which is a, a little fra- See, we don't, we don't, l- 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 let me summarize it this way, and then we'll give our friends a blessing and, and uh, go on to the other work we have to do here. Um, we don't make Norma's case through the interview clips that we're going to show of her. We have all kinds of interview clips of her. But this is not a story of battling interview clips. Right. Oh, she said this here. Oh, but she said that this in the there, documentary. Right. Oh, but she said this here. That's for the superficial knowledge. Right. Oh, what did she say at a certain moment when a camera was in her face? But again, we're talking from the 22 years of personal knowledge. Right. The emails, the conversation, the shared experiences, the personal journey. It was a journey. It was a journey. It was a journey of pain. It was a journey of healing. It was a journey of witness. It was a journey of struggle. It was a journey of speaking up for life. It was a journey of trying to make ends meet. It was a journey of prayer. As they say, we we were with her in good times and in bad. In good times and bad. And ultimately, the rejection of Roe is what we have to use this moment to teach people about. Not just that Roe herself rejected Roe, which she did and always meant, but it's that America rejects Roe because never at any time has a majority of the American people, never at any time and not today, believed that you should be able to kill a baby throughout pregnancy whether healthy or sick, whether the baby could live inside the, uh, outside the womb or not, that whether the mother was healthy or, or sick, that at any time and for any reason you could kill that baby, Norma McCorvey stood as the woman whose name was used for that decision, but who rejected it just like America rejects it. Right. You don't kill babies, and you don't stand for a policy that allows you to kill them throughout pregnancy. America has never believed in that, and, um, and, and, and that's what we need to use this moment to recognize that. Why are we allowing that to still be our policy if we don't believe in that? Jennifer. All right. Well, thanks, Jenna, for sharing these, uh, some of these insights. I'm and, sure uh, we'll have to be coming back again. And Hey, LA Times, be in touch. We'll be happy to talk to come you. On, come Times. on, LA Times. Did they call my Shannon. cell phone no, here? No, or, no, no. They didn't call your cell phone, Father. But because you know what? All sorts of people are going to be talking about this. They couldn't care less about the truth of what they're talking about. Yeah. But go to our Priest for Life website, right on the home page there. Um, I don't know if Krista put the action alert, but otherwise, could just go to priestforlife.org slash Norma, where we've always had this information. See, we just didn't snap quick, quick, quick. Oh, let's throw something together. We've always had this information up there about Norma yeah. uh, for people to look at and research. Because one thing Father Frank and I do, we promised both Sandra Kana and Norma McCorvey that we would be tirelessly speaking about the fact that both of them deeply, deeply regretted that they were used for those decisions. They worked their entire, up to the end of their lives to try to overturn those decisions. And like I said, one of the dying things we said to Norma was, she asked us, please continue to work to overturn Roe v. Wade. And that's what we promised. Chattanooga, Tennessee. Let's conclude with that little vignette. Uh Uh-huh. Dovey Bolton, Mary Doe, companion case of Roe v. Wade, she also rejected abortion. She always rejected abortion. Mm -hmm. We were together with Norma and Sandra at the National Memorial for the Unborn in Chattanooga, Tennessee, a former abortion facility, the walls of which are covered with plaques from moms and dads and other family members mourning the children they lost to abortion. And there is a plaque there from Norma and from from Sandra. Sandra. Right that they put there weeping saying that they were the women behind these decisions and that they committed their lives they did it at that moment and at countless other moments to seeing the end of those decisions the reversal of those decisions in fact norman actually took legal action this is where our friend alan parker can speak about this legal action to the court Mm -hmm. to the court to 
Reverse Roe v. Wade. Reverse Roe v. Wade. Yeah. Using legal mechanisms that uh, uh, right. that were available to them. But that beautiful uh, memorial that I hope people have a chance to go to at, at some point in Chattanooga, that tells a story in uh, in those on those stones, on those plaques, yeah. of deep regret. So many tears shed in that room, including by Roe and Doe herself, mm -hmm. themselves. And uh, it, 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 right there in, in, um, in those words on that plaque shows so beautifully the spirit for, with which they lived their lives and, right. uh, and made this effort. So, uh, so it's no surprise, is it? It's no surprise that this well, would, you know. I guess sooner uh, or later. Uh, people you know. always did try to do it. They always tried to do this, and they're going to try to do it again. Uh, let's, let's rewrite history. You know, let's twist the story. Let, let's, let's uh, you know, uh, well, Bernard Nathanson, uh, Carol Everett, Abby Johnson, you know, in fact, hundreds of other people. Hundreds and know, hundreds have come out of the abortion come industry. Come out of the abortion industry. No longer work there. And, you know, right. it's a particular form of arrogance to stand in judgment over somebody and and try to try to make it seem like that actual conversion wasn't real that's that is one of the most deep offensive forms of arrogance that a person can have that's right you know you didn't really uh, you didn't really convert um, nothing erases nothing erases history not even the person who lived it suppose I said to you now hey you know what I really don't uh, believe in the things of the of the priesthood or things of the Catholic faith, that still doesn't erase the reality of what I did over right. Right now. I've been a priest over thirty years. Doesn't erase the conviction, the truth, the the uh, the work, the sacrifice. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't, because. Um, the reality, as we've said from the beginning here today, is in the journey itself. And we were privileged to make that journey. That's and right. we're going to enable you, friends, to make it with us as we continue to talk about this in, uh, in the days ahead. So uh, don't be uh, deceived by uh, this uh, kind of nonsense, and uh, let's continue getting the word out. That's right. Any final word for no, our viewers? Well, no, just that I always considered Norma like a sister. She always considered me like a sister, and I'm offended that people are maligning the name of my sister. Yeah. My exactly. sister in Christ. Right. Well, may the Lord bless you, friends. May he strengthen you and make you effective witnesses to the unborn. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, friends, for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon.